You know, when your announcements are fun and anointed, you know you're at a good place. You know, the good church. <laughs> I can't do announcements. I can preach like five hours straight, but I cannot do announcements. I can't get up on stage and do an act or play or like, you know, that kind of stuff. Announcements just gets me. I can't do it. I remember when we were in church in Pennsylvania, we had um, our, uh, we have three kids. When our oldest daughter, when she was a little baby, it was right around Christmas time, you know, and, um, and they asked if, if I had long hair, believe it or not, long curly hair back then. And our pastor asked, Chandi, that's perfect. Would you and Sarah be Joseph and Mary for the Christmas play and you can have the baby with you? I said, oh, that's great. I can do it. You know, it's no, not a problem. They said, it's very easy. The stage will be dark. And there'll be like fluorescent, you know, marks on the stage so you know where to go. All you have to do is when it's dark, the lights go out. He was doing a little monologue, you know, follow the stars and sit down on a stool. That's all you have to do. I was a nervous wreck backstage. <laughs> You can ask Sarah. She's, she, she's a witness to this. She's like, what's wrong with you? I was wa- pacing up and down, literally sweating. She's like, Chandi, you don't, you're just going to sit on a stool. You're not going to even say anything. I, I was like, what if I trip on something? What if I get the timing wrong, you know? And I was like, oh, man. So I really appreciate anointed, anointed um, alpha <laughs> announcements. I know that it's, it, you need to be anointed to share, you know, powerful your, your, your uh, announcements powerfully like that. It was, uh, I want to join Alpha. <laughs> it's a great uh, joy for us to be here. Uh, you know, your fellowship is really dear. This church is really dear to our community in, uh, in Monyatis. Every time we talk about the riddles and, the, and different ones of you and New Life Church, it puts a smile on our hearts because we know the atmosphere of this church. It's full of joy. It's full of the presence of the Lord, full of the Spirit of God. And we enjoy that you are, you've embraced the Spirit of God in Cyprus, and you're walking it out with full confidence. And we love that. You know, we, we've, we've been praying for Cyprus uh, faithfully every week um, over the past years, and it's, it's amazing to see a church that's wholehearted in your pursuit of God with the fullness of joy. Uh, even just being here the, you know, this, this morning, I am being filled by the joy that comes out of your lives. So thank you for, uh, for you know, welcoming the Spirit of God, embracing Him and running with Him with all your heart. And we have so much more to see on this island, don't we? Yes. And we're going to be participants. God has put us here. He has handpicked us. And so you're going to be in Nicosia because I have a great work on this island. Yes. Such a privilege for us. And we're, we're privileged to be a part of this company in, in seeing what God has for us in the future. Um, yes. You know, as I was praying um, for this morning, um, over the past couple of weeks, I had a dream, um, and there was something in my heart for, for, to share this morning, but uh, I had a dream, and I was standing in an auditorium, and uh, it was low ceiling, but it was packed with young people, and I don't get dreams like this. I get dreams which is like, you really have to like get into like, what does this mean? You know, have you had dreams? You wake up and like, Sarah has dreams that are detailed. Like she, we'd wake up and go to, you know, worship in the morning. The whole way there, she's like telling me her dream. I'm like, honey, how can you dream like that? You know, I get, I can barely remember like a figure that I had in my dream. Uh, but I had this dream that I was, it, it was, you know how in the dream, in dreams you're in one place, but it's meant to be something else, somewhere else. I was meant to be speaking with you this morning, you know, on, on this Sunday morning. But before me was a room, it was like a hotel auditorium. It was filled with young people. And I was sharing a message that I had shared in our school um, last year, I think, or the year before. Um, and I want to pray that over, over, and I started praying into it. And I just feel there's, a, there's an open door for New Life Church for the youth, of Nic- especially Nicosia. There's a favor and grace upon your life, even with the analogy of the fish. You know, there are different ways we can do it, but there's, that when God opens a strategy with the breadcrumbs or the, you know, the crust or whatever, when God opens the time and the place, there's no stopping the, His influence in that, in that surrounding. You know, the same analogy that Jesus had with His disciples. They fished, you know, all this. We, in Luke 5, we toiled all night and we caught what? Nothing. You know, you were right on there with the disciples, you know. <laughs> then Jesus comes, you know, like a hot child. He says, you know, what, here's what I'm going to do. Why don't you fish over here? He said, we, 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 they didn't ask. They didn't say, but, 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 you know. You know what they said? At your word, we'll cast our nets where you tell us to. 
And that's the simplicity of their faith in responding. They didn't say, you don't, wh- who are you to tell me to put it over there? You just showed up. We've been here all night. You know, we fished there, 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 and there, and caught. They didn't say any of that. They knew him whom they served and loved. He said, hey, guys, cast the fish over here. They said, oh, come on. They knew they were going to catch something because he had said it. And I feel there's a grace on this word for the youth in Nicosia for you. That God would open, God would inspire this in your hearts with strategy and with plan, with careful ideas. Just like the careful planning Jesus said. He didn't say just cast your net again. He said cast your net right here. And they did it. So I, I pray that you, you, know, you would seek the Lord with this word and see how he opens a door for you. And I'll, I'll, be pray, I'll be faithful to be praying into it as well because he gave me that dream. There is a purpose for churches to be on this island. We are, this is a historic island with great biblical background and story. You know, there's a purpose that we will walk in and fulfill in our days. It's exciting. I remember, I remember uh, you know, a testimony from my own life. At one point, I had come to the, to the Gateway School to do my training uh, in the discipleship program. And then when I tried to come back in because of visa issues, I had an Indian passport at that time. W- because of visa issues, I came to the airport and I was sent back. I wasn't allowed to come in. And I went all the way back to, I was staying in India at that time. I went back to India, not knowing you know, how God would orchestrate me being able to come back and connect with the Rudolph family and the Gateways team, which you know, with them, uh, we'd walked together for so many years. I've known, I've, I met Matthew, my wife's older brother, um, in 93, and we've been walking together since then, and we knew this is a lifelong con- a covenant heart relationship, you know. And when I was sent back from here, I was like, I, you know, discouraged in part, but more asking, God, how will you fulfill your plans? But then his, according to his time, and in his amazing way, he brought me back. And with that return, Sarah and I got together. It was in the U.S. We came together um, in the U.S., and then we flew here. Um, and now, today, God has uh, given me the privilege of organizing what, you know, we have streams in the desert. It's bringing the churches together. Here, at one point, I was not allowed to come into the island, and here I am standing to bring the churches together, have like open like worship times, corporate worship times together. That is the faithfulness of God. When He looks and He releases His grace and His timing in our lives, there's nothing that can, that can stand in His way. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. We've had so many stories of God's faithfulness and his faith being filled and full in our lives that we've seen miracles happen. We were in Ethiopia at one, one time. Uh, we were leading a team, Sarah and I were leading a team in Ethiopia, and uh, we missed our flight connect, uh, to the next city. You know, we get to the airport. It's a very small airport. Past the check-in counter, I can see the dirt row path, and then the, the plane's right there, and that was the only fl- plane uh, in the airport. That's how small it was. And we got there late because of some other circumstances. And he said, nope, you cannot get on. We, the, gate, the plane closed the, gate, uh, closed the doors. We said, we have to get to Addis Ababa, the capital. He says, there's no planes tonight um, that, start, that originates here. There's only a flight tomorrow that goes from here to Addis. And we, we started praying with our team. And, uh, and, he's, and he said, you know, I said, we kept asking him over and over. He said, well, there is a flight but we normally never get people going on that flight from here. They just stop here to refuel and then carry on to Addis because they're always full. That flight was coming from Aksum, which is a very big um, tourist city. All the people go there for, you know, to, to visit the rock churches and things like that, and then they come back to the capital. But they stop in this Gondor, this out-of-the-way village, just to refuel because they're small planes, and then carry on to Addis. We said, we, ha- we must get on that flight. He said, look, I, I wish I could help you, but you can't. That flight is all, it's never been not full. It's always full, oftentimes it's overbooked. I said, well, why don't you, this is after like a half hour of talking back and forth. And he had told us, why don't you take a bus tonight, overnight, we, you know, you'll get to, we had so many things planned for the next day. And we said, I just felt faith rising in me. I said, no, we must get to Addis tonight, the capital city. He says, no, there's no way that's going to happen. He said, if it was one person, one or two people or a family, maybe there's some way something will happen. But for a team of 17, I said, it's not 17. We have 17 plus. We had a big djembe, a big drum. I said, that never was, you know, always a hassle. I said, we, we need 18 seats. He says, impossible. He says, I've been working here for over 18, 18 to 20 years. I've never seen, any, you know, anyone board that, this big a size from, for the flight from Oxford. He said, look, I told him, we're going to pray. And let's see what God does. So we turned to our team and I said, come on, guys, let's pray. 
So they started praying. I said, guys, listen, you need to pray like you want to get to Addis, you know? I said, don't, it doesn't matter you're in the airport, pray. And then they were like, come on, are you serious? I'm like, I'm serious. So we had an amazing prayer meeting. We just started, I said, pray like you don't know, you know what to do. And that's exactly the situation we were in. They started praying. And he told us, uh, maybe in an hour or hour and a half, you know, they'll, they'll close the, the doors to that flight. That's when he will know how many people are on the flight. He'll get the final report. He said it's always overbooked. And he said right now, he looked at the roster. He says it's overbooked. This flight is overbooked, and there's no way you have. Maybe one or two can go if there's any cancellation. So, the, so an hour and a half, we've been praying. We talked to the manager at the airport and everything. No other, no other solution for us. So the plane takes off, and we get to the counter, you know, and, we're, and he says, you know, You've been making a lot of noise. I'm like, we're sorry. We're just praying, you know. And I knew there was nothing else going on at the airport. So we weren't disturbing anybody. <laughs> there was one flight that was coming. We're praying about that flight. And he says, the, I said, Has the, have the doors closed? Can you give me a report? And he like, you know, he's done that so many times. He was at the point of getting really annoyed. I think he already was with me. And he checked and his, t- his eyes started to well up. I said, what happened? He says, I can, it's in all my life being working at the airport, I've never seen this before. He says it was full to overbooked. He says there are, uh, we needed 17 plus one. There are 18 seats available on this flight. Not 17, not 19. There are 18 seats available on this flight. Isn't that amazing? And our, our dear friend Mesmore, who's been a long, long-term friend of ours, is a uh, local Ethiopian fiery believer, he's preached the gospel to him. You know, such an open door for him to hear the goodness of God. And we were rejoicing. And all of our team, plus the awkward big Jimbe, had a seat. We buckled it in, gave thanks to the Lord, and flew to Addis that night. Isn't God good? When he releases, come on. Thank you, Lord. When he releases his grace, his kiss on something in our lives, there's nothing that can stop it. Even when we fail to show up on time to the airport, it was our fault. It wasn't their fault. You know, we didn't get to the airport on time. He's got our backs. He's got our backs. If we give all that we have to him with all our hearts, we say, God, here we are. Isn't that all that he asks of us? To be available, to be available to him, and he will perform his miracles on our behalf. It's amazing. It's a no-fail situation for us. You know, we go through trials and tribulations and things that that don't come to pass as we think it should, but God never fails in the end. He writes the story from the beginning to the end, and He has His say as He pleases. And all He asks us to do is stand in faith in pleasing Him through our faith. He will perform His wonders for our lives. Don't you love Him? Come on. Well, we want to, uh, I want to give you, send you greetings from our community as well. Uh, Matthew and Saras send their greetings to all of you, all of our community. They're praying for this morning. Um, and uh, Sarah is back there. That's my beautiful wife. Our three kids, six, four, and two. That's, that's not their names. That's their ages. <laughs> Sometimes we call them number one, number two, number three. Oftentimes we move from place to place. We travel a lot. We don't even see who's who. We like one, two, three. Okay, we're good. Let's go, you know. Uh, the oldest is Mer, Zion, and Kashmir. Beautiful children. Keeps us busy for sure. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the message that's on my heart for you this morning comes out of the life of a, of a character uh, in scriptures that's very, very dear to my heart. And I've been thinking and pondering and mulling the, the story of his life, different facets, different times of the story of this person's life for many, many years. Um, and uh, Pastor Greg shared this morning about, about uh, being, um, being like David, undignified like David. And that's a character that I want to talk about a little bit. You know, David's known for one thing among many things. What's the one thing he's known for? That we all were like, oh, I want to be like that. Huh? Goliath, yes. Heart after God. That's a pastor right there. <laughs> Having a heart like David. You know, God saw his heart. And I, that always intrigued me. That got me. I'm like, what was special about David? He was in the old covenant. He didn't know the fullness of our life with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. But yet God says of him, I like his heart. 
He has a heart after me. His heart is given to me. I'm like, what is it about his heart? He was a military brute. Unfortunate father. Faithless husband. Not faithful. What was yet special about him? He had so many shortcomings in his life. So many. But yet God said, there's something about his life that I want, that I love. His heart is after me. What? My heart's after him. But there was something special about it. There are many people in those days who loved the Lord. Many giants of the faith that we read about. But of David, God says, I love his heart. And for years I've been thinking and asking the Lord, God, give me a glimpse into what it is on your heart that was stirred by David's heart. It was not something special about David's heart in itself. It was something about his life and his heart that stirred the heart of God. And I'm like, I want to do what he did. Whatever it was, I want to do it. So I want to look into the life of David a little bit and see if we can get a glimpse. This is not, this is not an equation. This is what David did that pleased God's heart. This is a glimpse into his life. You know, Bible is all about storytelling. From the beginning till the end, even Jesus stopped in parables. Parables are just storytelling to paint. It's a small stories, you know, throughout scriptures that paint, that give us a big message within it. There's a, there's a heart message within each small story. And the story of David, one of the aspects of David's life that I want to paint for us, I want to invite you into the story. And let's see what God speaks to us. Who loves movies? Who loves to watch movies, yeah? You know, that's what movies does. Movies basically storytelling... And who's cried at movies watching a movie? Come on, guys. <laughs> guys are like, mm, mm. <laughs> I've cried at movies, man. I have. You know, that's the idea of, of movies that, that would it, it draw us in to the message, the, the theme, the, the storyline that would draw us in so much that we're in the movie. We're, the other night we were watching a movie, and towards the end, you know, the girl was going to get, you know, in trouble, and Sarah was like, <gasps> sorry, Philip. <laughs> That was the villain beating her up. And she was like, oh, no. And she couldn't handle it because we were right in the movie. That's what scriptures are intended for, that we will be invited right into the message of the story so God can speak something to our hearts. That's what movies does, opens our heart to the emotion, the reality of what they're playing. It's not real, but what God speaks through his word is real. And it's alive, it's living for us. So it's a time of David um, before... Uh, da- we, we bring David into the picture. Uh, there's this prophet in that time, Samuel. You know, the, uh, Saul, the first king, was disappointing in the heart of God, and, and, and the people were crying for another leader. God said, look, I'm, I saw, uh, Samuel, rise up. Don't mourn anymore. He was a prophet of that, of that whole nation. God said, Samuel, don't mourn for this man. Don't mourn for this man anymore. Rise up and go because I've anointed somebody else. And he gives him a strategy. And Samuel said, how can I go when Saul is still the king? How can I go anoint somebody else? If he finds out, he'll kill me. And God devises a plan. Part devious, but clever, you know. (laughs) God did a devious plan. What? He said, go and prepare a feast for for the city. So it doesn't seem like you're going to do something else. Prepare a feast. And while you're there, I'll show you who I'm going to anoint as king. So Samuel says, fair enough. So he prepares himself and goes towards towards the city. You know, I picture Samuel as an old man, you know, gray hair, long gray beard to his knees, bent over, you know, can barely walk, but he had a purpose in his heart, walking towards the city. While he was yet a far ways from the city, the kids were playing on the hills. They saw a figure that they had heard about, the, the, the famous name, the famous figure that their parents and the people in the village and their town had painted about the great man, the great prophet. And they're like, hey, that looks just like the, that looks like the stories we've heard about. Is that the prophet? And all the kids are like, ah! They scurry back to their village. Like, the prophet's coming! The prophet's coming! The prophet's coming! You know? And the kids run crazy. The prophet is coming! Because they had known, the, they would seen the distinctive features of this great prophet. And all of the elders of the town, they began to fear because prophets don't show up for no reason. You know, they don't just say, hey, I heard, uh, you know, you're having a party. What's going on? They don't just show up. They always carried a message. And oftentimes it was a, a message of judgment, you know, in those days. The earth could open up and swallow them, you know, or f- fire and whatever could happen. 
So they were full of fear. They said, well, look, let's meet Samuel even before he gets here. So all the elders, you know, packed up their stuff and ran up to meet Samuel. And, and, he, they, and they were worried. They said, what, what is the message he brings? And Samuel saw them coming from afar. And he said, I come in peace. He knew that they were, they were afraid. They said, don't worry, guys. I come in peace. And they were delighted. They said they welcomed Samuel into their town. I want to paint this picture quick to get to the heart. You know, this, this message when I share and the teachings, when we speak at our school, uh, the weeks that I'm teaching, it's, our teaching sessions are two and a half hours each day, you know, so I'll try not to go too long because <laughs> I love getting into the story. I, I'll know when the ushers stand up like bouncers. I know it's time to go. So they welcome him in. You know, they, they come to, they have the party that evening and he invites, and Jesse you know, Dave, David's dad and his family, they're all there at the party. And he knew it's from this family that God's anointing somebody. So Samuel talks to Jesse that night. He says, Jesse, I've come to anoint the next king of Israel. Bring me all your sons that I may see whom, whom God has favored and whom God... So Jesse says, okay, I have, I have, I have a lot of sons. And he's excited. And, and Jesse says, look, I'm going to parade them one, one after another. And I'm going to have them come up before you, and you, you can ask the Lord if it's any of my sons. So Jesse says, and Simon says, okay. Jesse says, Eliab, Eliab, are you there? Eliab, come up. Now Eliab, of the sons of, of uh, Jesse, Eliab was a, the biggest and the strongest of his sons. He stood head and shoulders above muscles, I mean, coming out of I don't know where. Everybody was afraid of, of, of Eliab. And he paraded Eliab before the prophet. And the prophet looked at him and says, Surely he looks just like Saul. This is the one. And, he, and, 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 and uh, Samuel said, This is not the one. Sorry. But let's give him a hand. It's always, it's always good to have a few strong people around. And Jesse was so disappointed. He said, that's, that's my, he's my oldest, he's my strongest son. He could be just like Saul, high head and shoulders above the rest. But God said, he's not the one. I don't look at the outward appearance. I'm looking at something deeper. I'm looking at something deeper to be the next king. Somebody with a, a quality that's yet deeper than that. So Jesse said, oh, okay, I have another son. I have another son. I'm going to call him up. Abinadab, Abinadab, are you here? Come up, son. And Abinadab comes running. <laughs> now Abinadab was the brain of all of the family. He knew everything. Anytime, not just the family, the whole village. If they needed anything, they asked him. You know, he had the latest technology stuff. He had everything in his pocket. He knew the latest news of politics. I mean, he was just wise. He was the only one that had been to college in his family. You know, Jesse said, surely this is, this is, he's learned, he's educated, he's brilliant, he's smart. I mean, I wish I had a, a, a new stuff like him. And, Je and, and Samuel looks at him and says, this could, God, could this be the one? <laughs> and God said, Samuel, this is not the one that I've chosen. Sorry, I've been a dad. But give him a round of applause. And Jesse's like, God, you know, what's going on? These are my oldest two, the strongest and the, the most, the, 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 the smartest of my kids. Who else could you choose? And, and, Je and uh, Samuel says, Jesse, bring me another son. And he calls his other son, Shama, are you there, Shama? Please come up. Now, Shama was the, 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 the most good looking among all of his sons. He had an amazing modeling career. His posters were all over town. You know, in those days, you couldn't turn anywhere without seeing, like, billboards of Shama over there, you know, around. Everybody loved him. He was, he was liked by everyone, you know? Just a beautiful smile, a friendly personality. They loved him. And Jesse said, surely, this is the one. And he stood by him and said, Samuel. And Samuel asked the Lord, and God said, Samuel, this is not the one that I've chosen. But give, come on. Don't you guys have a good looking pastor? 
We know that good looks come from his heart, doesn't it? And Jesse paraded all of his sons before, the, before Samuel. None of them. God said no, no, no to each one of them. And if I was a prophet, I would be more concerned than Jesse was. You know, here's the prophet of the nation, shows up. I'm going to anoint one of your sons. He parades all of his sons. And he says, God says no to all of them. And Jesse, you know, perseveres a little bit more. I mean, Samuel does. And he says, Jesse, is there, do you have any more sons? And he says, well, I have yet another one. Over there, look over there, he's by the sheep. In Hebrew, the word that describes this last son of Jesse in this account, in the storytelling, is the word hakaton, which means insignificant. The word that his own father uses to describe him, even when all the other sons failed, he's his last hope. Even at that point, his father says, there's, there's, a, there's an insignificant son, he's not important. He's over there. And, Je and Samuel says, bring him here. And Jesse says, Samuel, really, really please ask the Lord. It, maybe it's one of the other sons. Please ask him. It's not him for sure. He, I didn't even invite him to this party because he's young, not qualified. He just keeps sheep. There's nothing important or significant about him. Samuel says, bring him here. And Jesse brought his insignificance the father, that's his, the, his own father's title for him, the insignificant one. He brings him up. And God says, this is the one whom I'm going to anoint. If you turn to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. It says, um, then Samuel... took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. There are two things that are very, very key in this verse. One is that he anointed him with, an, with a horn of oil. This was the symbolic of that time. This is a strong anointing. When, David anointed, when uh, Samuel anointed Saul, remember that story in 1 Samuel chapter 10? When Samuel finds Saul as the first king of Israel, you know what he anoints him with? With a flask, with a jar. It's very different from the, the horn of, and we'll come to this in a little bit. This is significant in David's life. There's a sure anointing that's coming upon his life. And for the first time, for the first time, if you read this account from uh, uh, 1 Samuel 16 onwards, till this verse, the whole story plays out. Till this verse... His name is not even mentioned. And for the first time, even when his father called him, he didn't call him by name. But when the anointing of God was about to be released upon this young man's life, he was defined by his very name, by his very identity was revealed because the anointing of God was coming upon his life. And for the first time in this account, hi honey, Sarah, we have a runaway. Sarah here. Yeah, go, go to Ima. Ima's going to take care of you. It's fine. And for the first time, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon who? The insignificant one? No. The spirit of the Lord came upon David. For the first time, his very identity is married with the anointing and the call of God on his life. This is his desire for us. This is a desire of God. If his anointing is on us, it comes with, it breaks off the shackles of everything else in our past. His anointing and his call on our life comes with the equipping power to break off any limitations, any shortcomings, anything that can hinder our full inheritance with him. It's not something that we need to war over. It's not something that we need to wrestle over because the anointing of God carries inherently with it the power to see our calling fulfilled, our destiny fulfilled, our personality shaped and molded into the likeness of Yeshua, Jesus himself. 
And for the first time, he took the horn of oil. The prophet took the horn of oil and anointed him David. Anointed him to be king over Israel. It's an amazing story. We have been called and chosen for a great purpose. And with this comes the anointing of God. With this comes the affirmation from heaven that nothing else can challenge. I remember when I got saved, I got saved in Dubai. I moved to the U.S. to go to college. And I, I didn't know, I had never read scriptures before. You know, I, I had, I, we, we, we grew up in an Orthodox church, Syrian Orthodox church, very similar to Greek Orthodox. But I never knew anything about scriptures. I started, somebody gave me an old King James Bible. I remember I, sitting in my room in my dorm reading through scriptures, you know. And I read through the New Testament scriptures and I felt I was unzipping like a jumpsuit of my old life. And I stepped out into something I just felt so equipped by just by reading. I had no baggage of things in my life. Yes, it just it was easy as unzipping and walking into the fullness of God for my life. I didn't know anything that evening when I felt this presence come. I'm walking into something new. We were, I walked to a prayer meeting that all of my very, very passionate, radical friends, you know, and it was a Christian college, but all the international students were, were, the, were the passionate ones. You know, they were from, I had friends from Kenya, India, um, Mozambique, um, Ghana, Ghanaians, all of my, all of these friends, um, some Filipinos, we were all passionate for the Lord. I didn't know much, but I knew that I, w- I wanted to give them everything I had. So I was going to one of these meetings, and in college we do some things. The prayer meeting started at one o'clock in the morning. I don't know why to this day. I never cared to ask at that time. So I'm walking from my room. I had this experience. I'm walking towards in this dimly lit pathway to, the, to the, the basement of this house where we had prayer meeting. And there's a couple sitting by the floor. And this girl's wailing. I'm like walk up to them. And, and this guy's laying on her lap on the floor. And he's like convulsing. This is a Christian college. And I had, I'm fresh out of the book of Acts. You know, I'm fresh out of the experiences of the Gospels and that what Jesus did and what the disciples did. I climbed on top of this kid, straddled him, and I started to cast out demons. I'm like, in Jesus' name, come out of him. And he started foaming at the mouth. This is a Christian college. And I knew nothing better to do because this, <laughs> this is all I knew to do, you know. And that's how I started my walk with the Lord. Not holding anything back. I felt, as I'm sharing this message, I felt I'd walked just like David was called out of insignificance out of sheep keeping insecurity and insignificance god called him out anointed him night and day within a second when god's voice his hand his call is on your life there's nothing of your past that can hold you back you know we go through uh sessions of healing and deliverance we do this in our school with this with the students you know we walk through this path path with them it's not because the things of the past has power over the call of god on your lives it is because our mind has allowed them to take the place of God's rule and reign in our lives. It does not have the power to challenge God's work in your life. Your past does not have the strength to challenge the work of God in your life and the call of God in your life. Some of you here just have, are here just because of your inheritance from generations ago. But you're here because there is a sure calling, a sure horn of oil, anointing oil that has come over your life. And you're here for, pers- uh, for a reason, not by happenstance, not by chance. Let's turn to, to Psalm 18, and I'll, I'll finish with this idea as we, as we lo- look at, you know, so, so God chose this young, at that time insignificant little boy. He says, David, let, I'm going to anoint him. There was something that was already resident in the heart of David, that God says, that pleases me. It was not after he became king that he learned how to love God. There was something already resident because the call of God was surrounding him. Even before, I feel, even before he was chosen, he was anointed, the spirit of God was around his life. He knew, he sensed, there was a sense about him, something lovely about the presence of God that I love. And while he was there, in obscurity, in, I call, in my mind, I say sheep keeping obscurity. That's what people saw him do. Oh, he's keeping sheep. He's not significant. But what he was doing is something about his heart loved God. And he magnified God in his heart. 
he began to, to give God all of the greatness. Not the king, not the prophet, not the people around him. He started to magnify the name of God in his life. So while he was keeping sheep, the one thing that he did was meditated on the very nature of God day in and day out. There are scriptures that, you know, of later it says, On my bed, I remember you. I remember you in the watches of the night. Day and night, I meditate on, on the Lord, on the precepts of God. You know, the whole idea of meditation is a lost art in church life today. Meditation doesn't mean you become an ascetic, you, be, you become a monk and, you know, get away and, you know, leave everyone else, leave the fellowship and just be by yourself. Meditation means you cannot get the nature of God out of your mind. You cannot get the goodness of God out, the things that he has done in your life, the, na- the things that you read in scripture. You just cannot get it out of your mind. That's the meditation that we've been called to. David, I feel that was one of his key uh, elements of his life in his relationship with the Lord. Even before he was anointed, he meditated. He magnified God bigger than himself. He magnified God bigger than his circumstances. This is why soon after he was anointed, he ran up. He was still you know, bringing lunch to his brothers who were at war. Even after his anointing, they didn't consider him to be anything but insignificant sheep keeper. While his brothers went to war, he was young. He was at home keeping sheep. And his dad said, hey, take lunch to your brothers. He took lunch. He was still being who he was at that time. But when he heard something challenge what was real, more real to him on the inside, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? It's not because of the anointing. It's because he had magnified God even before the anointing of God. And the anointing of God gave him courage to run against this giant. He says, you will die today. Because there's a reality inside of him he had already built. He, when he heard Goliath, he didn't have to go behind the tent of the, of the, of the, the, the soldiers and have a prayer meeting to go out. As soon as he heard it, he started running against this giant. Who is this that stands against what is real in my life? Isn't that amazing? And God says, I love this guy. I'm in trouble now, but I love this guy. I have to figure out a way for him to kill Goliath. <laughs> God's like, what? David, what, what, are you doing? what are you doing? Maybe God had planned for somebody else, you know, to kill him. But God says, I love this guy. Let's read Psalm 18. We'll get a glimpse into his, David's relationship with the Lord. As I have been thinking about David's life, what is that secret? How did he magnify the Lord? What, what boldness did he have? What, what access did he have into the presence of the Lord? This is what I see. Psalm 18. I'll read, start reading from the beginning. This is a psalm he wrote after God had delivered him from Saul and his other enemies. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He recalls. He brings back to memory the calling and the anointing on his own life. God had poured the oil from Samuel's hand with the horn of oil. That's what he recalls here. The horn of my salvation. The horn, the, the, he, he, he marries his salvation with God's choosing. God calling him out of obscurity into prominence because of his call in his life. And he brings to remembrance the horn of my salvation. I will call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now here he goes on to say what's going on with him. The pangs of death. I mean, he's pretty theatrical, Right? The pangs of death, he probably did. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him, even to his ears. So David's crying in the midst of one of his most difficult and pressing circumstances of his life. David says, I will call upon the Lord because I know he hears my voice. Most of us would stop right there. If we were writing Psalm 18, 
we would stop right there. I've prayed. I've cried out to the Lord all night, all day. I know God hears my prayers. But he goes on. He keeps writing. He keeps writing. And this gives me a glimpse into the nature of his relationship with the Lord. He keeps writing. And my, my cry came before him, even to his ears. Verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. That's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. I prayed to God. I, you know, I was in trouble. I prayed. He heard me. And he was angry for me. The earth shook. The foundations began to shake. The mountains trembled. Because God was responding to me. He not only had the confidence of his place of asking the Lord. He had confidence and clarity of God's response back to him. And it goes on, verse 8. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. This is audacious. What do you, this is blasphemous in part at that time. What do you mean smoke went up from his nostrils and fire came out of his mouth? That's what my kids talk about and stuff, you know. But he had the picture of how furious God's desire was back for him. He not, this is a key for David, not only did he know how much he loved the Lord, he had clarity in the imagination of his mind how furious, strong, and purposeful was God's desire for him and was God's response to his every cry. Isn't that amazing? The horn of my salvation. I cried out to him in my deepest distress. And my God arose. Angry and fire, smoke from his nostrils. Fire from his mouth on my behalf. And God says, I love this guy. I love this guy. I'm actually going to make a dragon. You know, Maybe God made a dragon after David talked about it. I don't know. But God loved the boldness and the audacious nature of David's relationship with God. And that was inspired from his own heart. That came from David's own heart. It wasn't something theological that he grabbed. And if you keep reading it, he bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick cloud passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. This is amazing. Just because that was his picture of how my God will answer the cry of my heart. Can we write a psalm about God's response to us? Not only should we cry to the Lord and ask the Lord, but we have the confidence like David did. No matter what our qualifications are, no matter what people have said about us, no matter what our family has labeled us as insignificant, he's crazy, we don't know what he's up to, he's this Christian thing, you know, we don't know what he's doing. No matter what, has been your past. Now, because God's eyes are upon you, His anointing is over your life, you have full access. Full access. Not only to ask the Lord, but to expect a strong response from God's heart. This is not just talking about the needs of our lives. This is also invitation for us into a, a confident relationship with the Lord. A confident relationship where he is continually magnified in our hearts. Continually magnified. And it'll be amazing to see how God answers the prayers even when we don't pray. There was a time Sarah and I were traveling. We had so, I've had so many visa problems. We've traveled so much and, uh, and I had so many difficulties. One time I was trying to come to, to Cyprus from the U.S. And um, I, with an Indian passport before I could come the island and they would stamp you know two weeks or three weeks or something like that but i we didn't realize that cyprus joined the eu i don't know when it was and you know several years ago and so we were traveling that december to come for sarah's sister's wedding 
and we get to the airport in Washington, D.C. This is post 9-11, you know, and especially in Washington, D.C. And they said, sir, where's your visa to Cyprus? I said, we, I don't need a visa. I get it upon arrival. They, they said, no, you can't, you can't do that. You, can't, it's, uh, you have to have a visa before going. We talked an hour-long conversation back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they said, there's no way you can get on this flight without a visa to Cyprus. Apparently, because Cyprus joined the EU, they had changed some of the regulations for an Indian passport. You needed a visa to get, before getting to the airport. We didn't know. We didn't think about you know, the change in regulations at that time. And we said, come on, let's pray. We must get on that flight. So we started to pray. Hour and a half. We got there early because we had kids, and we were like, oh, we don't want to be rushed. You know, let's have more time to just hang out than run after the plane, like oftentimes we do. Uh, so we had an hour, an hour and a half of talking back. They talked to the manager, airlines, you know, all the supervisors. Finally, everyone left except for the counter, the lady at the counter. Hour and a half later, we are praying, praying, praying. She leans over and says, I'm going to tell you what I'll do. I'll let you go on to London. I'll have them deal with you there. <laughs> I said, are you kidding? I gave her, I grabbed the passport, gave it to them. She stamped it. We got our passports and we ran to our gate. Now I'm more scared than I was before. <laughs> you know, I'm like running to the gate looking to see if there's any cops following me. We get to the gate. We're like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, cease from praying until we get, you know, into the flight. We got into the flight. I'm like looking at the door. Please don't let a policeman walk in or the customs officer. You know, the gate, the door finally closes, and Sarah and I look at each other. We're like, I can't believe it. I'm on this flight. We're coming for a wedding and for you know, Christmas holidays, and we're giving thanks to the Lord. You know, we're so excited we were able to get on the flight in an impossible situation. God worked on our behalf. We weren't even, I did not, I was praying, but honestly, I wasn't expecting to get on the flight. <laughs> I was expecting maybe something will work out. Not that she would all of a sudden say, you can get on this flight. So we get to London and they ask us, we're, you know, transiting through. They ask us, where's your visa? And I said, uh, you know, I, uh, not trying not to say what happened before. They said, uh, I don't know how you got here, but we cannot put you on this flight. There's no way you can get on this flight. Now we're with Sarah's other, Nehemiah and Shirsty. And they went and we said, you guys check in and we'll work it out. And we prayed, prayed, prayed. They said, no way, this is illegal. And they were questioning us, how did you get here from Washington, D.C.? How did they get, let you on the flight? And we were like, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, I couldn't say anything, you know. <laughs> I didn't have an answer for them. They said, no, you're not getting on the flight. And so we missed that flight. We said, look, can I, maybe I can talk to the Cyprus Airlines. So I went, went to another counter and they said, there's no way. You have to, uh, rules change and there's nothing that we can do. And I said, how about we go to the Cyprus Embassy in London and see what they can do for us? You know, maybe they, maybe they can help us. Um, and and um, so we went to the Cyprus, uh, this, and the airline said, there's no way you can go to Cyprus Embassy because you don't live in London. You have to have residency, loc, show loc, that you live here in order to get a visa from the local, local embassy. You can't just be a visitor and get it because they'll be like, why don't you get it from your hometown, you know? So we said, look, we don't have another option. We're going to go. So we, we didn't have a jacket or anything because we were planning to come to Cyprus. It wasn't as cold in that, that December here. But we get out to London with myrrh in a stroller, and freezing cold. I think I was just in a T-shirt and Sarah had a little thin shirt on. We walked, made our way. A lot of things happened in between, just bizarre. It was like um, twilight zone. We finally make it to the Cy Cyprus embassy in London. And we talked to the lady at the counter, and you know, we tell her what's going on, the whole situation. We said, look, we didn't realize. And she says, okay, talk to him. So he's sitting right there. He heard the whole thing and, and moved over one step. He said, yes, how can I help you? I'm like, uh. So I tell him the whole story of what happened. And while I'm talking to him, the council general, this is like the highest, you know, the, the, the main, the big shot of the, of the embassy in, Cyp uh, or in London, Cyprus embassy. He walks by, it's morning time. He has a coffee and a donut or something in his hand. And he sees us with the kid, with the baby. He says, oh, you know, started talking to Mer. Mer was around this age. Now she's six. She's going to be seven. And so he says, What's, what happened? And so we tell him the story, the whole story, everything that happened. We're like, we didn't realize what was going on, and now we're stuck, we're stranded, you know. And, and he says, oh, okay. So, so we said, we're going to my sister's, my wife's sister's wedding. We're going to celebrate Christmas. He says, oh, okay, where, where, where in Cyprus are you going? I said, oh, it's a small village in the mountains. It's called Monyatis. And he says, Monyatis! I'm from Monyatis! Come, 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 come! <laughs> And he, and he takes us to his office, 
This is the council general. He sits us down, gives us, you know, gives us things to drink. He's like, oh, what's going on? And he's talking about Trimiclini, the flower shop, all the little shops, you know, the turns in the streets. Like, yes, yeah, we're right by there, you know, the dam. And, and he's so excited to meet somebody that, that's going to Moniati that lo- that's from his village, you know. And he says, and, oh, well, you're stuck here. Okay, do you have passport size pictures? We said, look, we didn't, we didn't think we we're going to be applying for a visa. He says, okay, give me your passport. He takes our passport, goes out to the photocopy machine, copies our passport picture, comes out, cuts it out, sticks it on our application form. He said, come back in a couple of hours, I'll give you your visa. Come on. Come on. Several hours late before in D.C., they said, there's no way you're getting on this flight. Only because, not because we prayed hard, only because the kiss of God over our lives at that time. He got us through from, from D.C. to London. And in London, when they said no, God opened an even better door that we would get a visa stamped to come. Uh, and then we, you know, we missed that evening's flight. We came back to the airport. We didn't have uh, money to get a hotel room. We looked at the hotel kiosk. You know, we said, oh, we can't. They're, they were like, oh, this is special, 300-some pounds per night. And like, oh, thank you. We'll, we'll wait for the next flight in the morning. So we found a little Costa's, um, Costa coffee. You know, Costa Coffee Shop that started in Cyprus as well. Uh, in the corner of, of Heathrow, we found a couple of nice leather couches. We made a little, little house for us. We sat down. We're so exhausted by now, emotionally, mentally, physically. We just want to, like, you know, sleep and go to sleep. And we sat down on the couches. And about a half hour, we got a drink. And a half hour later, go to eat, my honey. Here. About a half hour later, this gentleman walks up to us. He has an Italian-French accent, which I can't do really well. My wife makes fun of me if I try it. And he says, you know, wow, what's going on here? Why you're still here? I said, I saw you at the hotel kiosk asking about a hotel room. Are you not, uh, didn't get a room? I said, no. At this time, I'm like, I don't want to talk through our whole story again. We're so wiped out, but I want to be nice. And he's being nice. I said, okay, you know. I tell him basically the whole situation. He says, oh, that's terrible. The airline should put you up in a hotel. Here you are with a family, with a baby, you know. And we said, we're going to stay the whole night here. He said, how can you stay the whole night here? You know, you have a baby. She needs to wake up at night. She needs to go to the bathroom. Maybe she, you need to change her diaper. Then she wake up again. You have to feed her. And we're like, thank you for rehearsing what, is, <laughs> what to expect in the next few hours through the night, you know. <laughs> and he says, you know, I have a family. I have a family, and it, it, for me, it breaks my heart to see you like this in this situation. You know, I have a young, a young daughter just like yours. Here's what I want to do. I'm here on a business, uh, you know, uh, trip, and my company's paying for my hotel. Here's what I want. I cannot, I cannot have this happen. Here's what I want to do. You will come with me and stay in my hotel room, and I will take your place here in the airport. Total stranger, complete stranger. We don't know him from Adam. We probably know Adam better than him. (laughs) We actually do know Adam better than him. And I was thinking, either he is an angel and a blessing from God or some kind of like weirdo going to like hack us up or something, you know. (laughs) I have to be wise, you know. But it seems more like an angel. I'm like, thank you, Lord. So we stand, go outside waiting for the bus to come. Our bus number was 12, you know, the shuttle that goes to this place. We didn't even ask them what hotel. We were just thankful. Uh, and all from number 1 to 11 buses came. Skipped 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> we're standing outside in the cold with this guy for over an hour, and we get to share our lives with him. We get to share the goodness of God in our lives. We said, look, you are an angel to us. We love God. He asked, what do you do? I said, I, I teach the Bible. And he says, you teach? You're young. Why? And he was so intrigued by our lives. And we shared the gospel Alpha course. We shared it with him, you know. Maybe I got it wrong. because I, <laughs> Guys, take the Alpha course. <laughs> and we shared the goodness of God in our lives. And he says, no, I'm not an angel. You know, I'm actually, I'm very, very bad. All this, I know one thing. Oh, this is Christmas time, right? So in his perspective, all year long, I've been very, very, very bad. Bad, 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 bad. But on December 8th, Nikos was a very good boy. He knew he was doing something good for us, you know. So we get to the hotel. He tells the concierge what's going on. The concierge's eyes are tearing up. He says, I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. We share the good news with him of what's going on. He finally says, okay, he gets the key. And he says, I'll walk you to your room. Now I'm a little more 
half, half thankful, half paranoid, you know. So I've got Sarah on the other side. I'm in the middle, and I'm walking, you know, wanting to rejoice, but I still can't fully. I'm looking to see if his expression changes or anything. He gets us, opens the door, lets us in. He says, looks good, enjoy your evening. And we said, look, can we pray for you? And we end up praying for the man and, uh, you know, blessed him and sent. And he, he said, I asked him, are you going to get another room? He says, no, I will take your place at the airport. This is an unbeliever. When we are given wholeheartedly to the Lord, when we respond to him by just saying, God, here we are, there's no limit to what God will do and perform for our lives. David, from sheep-keeping obscurity, God called him in an instant to be the king of that nation. When God's purposes are on our lives, nothing can hinder even our shortcomings, our failures, the things that the, the limitations around us, it's nothing for the Lord if we say, God, here we are. Use us as you please. So, Father, I thank you for this community, God. I thank you for this faithful community of believers who believe your name for all it's worth. God, we don't want to be shortchanged in what you will do for our lives, God. The fullness of our inheritance in you, we want it, Lord. We want to receive it. We want to receive healing, God. We want to receive provision. We want to receive the goodness. We want to receive, walk in testimony after testimony of your faithfulness in our lives. If you're going through a difficult situation, trust in the Lord. And let him strengthen your heart and strengthen the circumstances that are limiting you and pushing you all around. Because he's faithful. He's faithful. His faithfulness has been defined throughout generation in the lives of people just like you and I. And he's not about to be unfaithful. So, Father, we look to you with all we are. For the destiny and the purpose of this church, I declare that this church will walk in the full confidence and the full measure of what you have called them to, God. Nothing will hinder. Nothing will stop. Nothing will limit. Nothing will steal away from what you have called this church to. Each family here, God, will be fulfilled in joy in following you. I thank you for the youth of this church, God. We thank you that you have marked their lives and you've called them to be leaders in their generation. You have marked them, you've called them out, God. We thank you. Even that their own doing and their own thoughts will not be able to steal away from your purposes in their lives because it's greater. We thank you for the youth in the city, God. God, we thank you for the access. We thank you for the door that you are opening. We thank you that there is a great door that's open in favor and in grace for this community to walk right into, God. That you will make it clear. You reveal it, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. We love you this morning, God. We love you. We love you. And just like David, we want to be those. Even maybe we're in obscurity. We feel like nobody knows me. No one sees me. But I will tell you this. God sees you right where you are. And his horn of anointing is over your lives to call you by your name into your full destiny. Thank you, Lord. I speak a blessing over this church. I speak a blessing over this community. In Yeshua's mighty, mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.